It tends to get enmeshed in other fucked up relationships. You just end up in these things and you like don't know how to get out. And it's fucking weird. And I gotta say, as angry as I am at those guys, I'm angrier at myself for like not getting out. Uh, if you read an item of soul copying, but instead of making music, you produce toys, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> the toy I would produce would be a Luger. <laughs> Alright, any other uh, gnarly soul copying questions out there? Lay them on me, come on. How's your guitar, dude? That's not about soul coffee. Uh, this is, uh, it was just, uh, <coughs> CGC, uh, C, yeah, C's and G's. <laughs> Where is, I don't know who the fuck I am from True Dreams of Wichita sample from. I don't know who the fuck I am. Tell us about the song. Oh, it's from, it's from a sex line, actually. Like a chat line. Nice. Um, I don't know what he's actually saying, but, uh, but like I just recorded it on my answer. It wasn't like a, it was like a, it was like 550, there were all these 550 numbers. And it was just like dudes talking, it was like 10 dudes and one lady that was paid to be there. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Who was most high when we were making the music? Dude, I don't fucking know. <laughs> I was only in my head. Do you have a favorite soul coughing song? No. <laughs> Oh, yes. Super Bob Mod. Super Bob Mod's alright, I guess. Uh, Did you write all the lyrics? Oh, yeah. Every single one. Every fucking single one. <laughs> um, and uh, really, I wrote, there was sort of like 70% songs that I wrote entirely, and 30% songs that were like, came out of jams. But in terms of like, turning those things into actual songs and having like a melody and sort of, Floating up the parts, that was all me. However, my bandmates were sort of uh, in between like con men and insane. <laughs> Criminal. Criminal, I don't know about Come on. Come on. Base Base player. Base player. Base <laughs> the, uh, the sampler player would play very quietly during orders, very quietly. would be like, dude, turn it up, what are you doing? Um, so it was really weird. So then I read an interview with him years later, which he basically said that what he was doing was controlling our minds with quiet sample playing. <laughs> For real. And so like if you asked him, he'd be like, I wrote those songs because I control his mind. For real. And then the rest of them were just like, uh, like imagine having a conversation about whether or not it is raining. <laughs> it's raining. Nope, not raining. Uh, but there's puddles there. Nope, not rain. It's <laughs> puddles. Doesn't matter. My shirt is very wet. Not raining. That's what it was like with the song. To be like, but I wrote this song. Nope, didn't. Nope, we wrote it. It's fucking weird. But, and I am a mess. <laughs> it's raining. Helping, I don't know. I mean, all these stories. Well, the one thing that I thought was that everybody knew how fucked up it was. And nobody knew how fucked up it was, because none of you can read my mind. <laughs> um, so, like, I was just like, I'm a beaten dog when it comes to soul talk. Like, people talking about soul talk, I'm like, oh, don't hit me. Um, so, yeah, and I guess, I mean, some people thought I was a dick about it, which I guess I was a dick about it. But inside, I was like, oh, don't hit me. You know. It was, uh, they were messed up years. Why did this gauge reject it? Because it didn't sound as long. And because we had this A&R guy who was, basically not only were soul coughing fucked up, but everybody that we attracted was fucked up. <laughs> like I was uh, just so fucked up that every, like I just was attracted. Like if you were a healthy person, I'd be like, oh, get out of my way, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and the, one of the weird things was, Everybody thought I was the problem. But everyone was like, why does the dirty just chill the fuck out? And so like this, this sort of thing of like, uh, he doesn't really write the songs, was like endemic to the whole operation. Like 
guys at the label and like marketing guys and like roadies and all that shit. Um, so this guy uh, who was so Bobby's an R guy was like a master of passive aggressiveness. Like like and she was like the Jedi of passive aggressiveness of all time. And he basically like did not want me to have a path out of it. You know, he wanted me to stay in it. Um, and like uh, yeah, he, he basically like did not help me. And uh, yeah, it was, it was fucked up. I mean, like a smart man would be like, okay, fine, drop me, and I will go put it out on an amphetamine reptile. That is not what I did. How did you get out eventually? Uh, eventually, well, the first thing that happened was everybody sat me down at right before LOs came out at Warner Brothers at the Rockefeller Center, the headquarters, and they were like, you gotta chill the fuck out. Why are you being a problem? <laughs> Seriously, like, what? Why don't you? Why don't you just chill out? This is so great. Everything is so great. Just fucking chill out. And I had a breakdown. Um, and uh, and so they were like, well, let's let's get Dodie to a shrink. And so they found the shrink. Uh, and they told her they were like, listen, we have this guy. He's really messed up because he doesn't understand how good he has it. <laughs> Literally, they basically said this. We want you to sort him out and get him so he's like tip top shape and like super into this thing. Holy shit. Yeah, it was fucked up. And so, and so then the shrink sat down with me and was like, no, I'm going to get you out of this abusive, fucking horrible relationship. Totally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> but then, like, the, the shit would happen, like, uh, like eventually, even, you know, it was basically like I felt like my whole life had been hijacked. Like the shit that I wanted to do with my life had been hijacked. And I just was like, fine, you know, what I really wanted out of life, pure shit. Like, don't like it, um, don't like the people I'm with, I'm just like an adjunct, and it's like, it's like the shittiest job you ever had. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna start getting high when I wake up, you know? <laughs> so when I sort of control the problem, I was like, you know what? Nope, I still got some heroin, I think I'll get high right now. And then eventually someone will push me on stage. Uh, and then I would go to therapy and like not out. I'd be like, oh, you know. And the first thing, the first thing she did, like 15 minutes after being here, she's like sort of doing this, like asking questions. She's like, uh, oh, do you, uh, you know, do you use drugs? And I said, well, really, I only use them to make music and have sex. <laughs> and she said, well, you know, there's a 12-step meeting down in St. Mark's place. You're just like, whoa. What the fuck? You don't, you don't know me, you know me for like 15 minutes. Cut to, a year later, I'm like nodding out. And finally waking up, she's like, so they're looking at me. And she goes, you know there's 12 set meetings on St. Mark's place. <laughs> oh, what the fuck do you know? Jesus, you don't fucking know, man. <laughs> but when I said the thing about, um, about uh, the, uh, the, the, the music and the sex, deep within me, a tiny voice was like, those are the best things. And you should not need something to make that happen. Like, they should just be super good. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, I guess the, the, the short answer is like, I was desperate. And desperation was a gift, and my life almost ending was a gift. Because if I had managed to maintain, I would still be in that fucking band, I would be Playing, I mean, the band was not like going like this. It was like, you know, like my bandmates were determined to bring it down. And like I would be playing little tiny clubs, singing Super Bowl on over and over again, trying to stay high. Really.